So, if I can introduce, uh, I've already introduced her before, but uh, just once again, this is Verena Simpson from Guardian IP, uh, Guardian IP Consulting or Guardian IP? Consultancy. Guardian IP Consulting. Yeah. Um, so, Verena's done uh, a lecture for this course for the last, uh, well, certainly last year, I'm not sure whether she did it the five. year before that. That's five years. <laughs> okay. There you go. <laughs> Long before me then. Um, so if we could perhaps give her a, a warm welcome before she takes on today's uh, lecture. Um, <clears throat> uh, my thoughts were to um, uh, try to continue from your presentations last time I was here and to create a, f uh, a, a morning where you could um, progress with your uh, invent inventive ideas, but in the context of some knowledge that I could impart to you this morning. Um, so my thoughts were to break up the morning till 12 uh, with giving you some idea about uh, criteria for patentability. And then uh, um, I thought I, should, uh, I uh, would go through some of the student projects uh, where you, some of you have sent me an outline of uh, your invention and have looked at the prior art. Um, I uh, spoke to um, Tom and we, uh, <coughs> we, we selected out some projects which uh, inherently or more clearly to me lent themselves to be, to, to be patentable inventions and so therefore I focused on those. Uh, I can't talk about all of them today, um, but uh, what I wanted to tell you was that I would be very happy to um, take lunch with each of you. Who, that I think there were two groups that, I, that you've sent me information where I haven't done anything with, about it, but I would be very happy to uh, invite you down to um, the corner of this site uh, and you could have lunch with me and then I could go through uh, uh, your inventions. Um, and forgive me for not doing everybody now, but I, don't th I think that this is a better solution. Um, and, and I'm actually on the corner of the site in DTU Sion, so it's, it's, it's no big deal, it's just the other side of the water tower. Um, and, I, and I mean that quite seriously, and I, I will get back to you. Um, and then uh, finally, to talk a little bit about strategic and commercial decisions when uh, seeking patent protection, because actually it's a very expensive process. Um, now, here you will see that I uh, talk a little, uh, have a slide which is saying something about computer in implemented inventions. That's partly because many of you have got, uh, who are working on projects which are uh, in some way related to uh, or, or imp imp implementing uh, computer related aspects. And uh, this is perhaps an area which is most difficult to patent. And so therefore I thought, well, I will tell you something about patentability, but I will give you some examples related to computing um, because that is an area which may impact you, many of you in the future, and uh, will, will illustrate what I have to say in, in, in general terms. Um, so the, 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 the question uh, with all inventions is, can it be protected? Um, is it worthwhile? Um, <clears throat> and that's where we are going to go. Uh, I have one uh, slide here just to give you a feel for the fact that um, uh, patenting, patenting is recognised in society as uh, important, um, so much so that it's actually part of the uh, US Constitution. Um, and you will see that it uh, is phrased in the way that the Congress shall have power to promote the progress of the useful arts. Useful arts, that means technology. Uh, and <clears throat> by securing for limited times to inventors the exclusive right to their discoveries. Uh, and this was in 1790. So it gives you a feel that uh, um, the American economy and uh, very early on recognized the importance of, 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 of patenting. And of course it's important to realize that it's something between uh, um, 
uh, encouraging progress in technology and then making some reward. And the reward, it's important to see that it is, uh, the reward is something about uh, exclusive rights. But it's important to realize that the exclusive is to do with a monopoly. It's not about the right to the patent uh, or to, 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 to actually carry out the invention. Um, so so uh, I, it's important to uh, realize that while you may seek uh, patent rights, um, <coughs> you, you, when you're finally granted those rights and they are uh, granted in the country where you live, then the actual carrying out of the invention, so, so, so once you're granted rights, let's say in Denmark, for your invention, that means you can exclude others from carrying it out. But the actual carrying it out yourself or by a licensee, that is determined by national law. And that is, of course, because some forms of activity in society is not to be encouraged. So um, nobody is going to encourage you to uh, make and use uh, landmines in Denmark, for example. Um, so, so there are a lot of, uh, one has to remember, it's very critical to remember that patents do not give you the right to carry out the invention, it only gives you the right to exclude others, so, so hence this monopoly. Uh, the period is 20 years, that's the date from which you first file your application. Um, this time period is actually, uh, it might seem a long time, and it is a long time in some technologies in the computer world, uh, uh, after 20 years, things are not very interesting any longer. But in the pharmaceutical world, the, the, the situation might be very different. I don't know if any of you have any thoughts about why um, 20 years might be too short for a pharmaceutical company. Any offers? Yeah? The developing part of the is extremely <coughs> pharmaceutical products. So maybe 20 years is enough time to return and invest them? Uh, <coughs> certainly. Um, and any ideas about uh, uh, other reasons why 20 years is not enough? It might be interesting to see the effects of the pharma <coughs> sort of medicine on a patient after 20 years. I mean, how would they feel after having been affected by this? Uh, well, you're coming close. I mean, testing. Testing, yeah. Testing, yeah? Yes, basically, the, well, I'm guessing that when this patent the product is not it's not ready for the market yet they have to do to the testing and have it approved by the different authorities and that period takes as we call very long time up to upwards ten years something like that to, to do it so again they don't have any time for the return of the uh, in fact what happens is that with um, in order to get permission to market a drug you have to provide the authorities with all types of information tests and the like um, and that takes, in, and then at the end you get a marketing authorization. And then uh, on the basis of gaining a, a marketing authorization, you can actually get an extension of your patent term. And that's usually about five years. And then you can get a further extension if you've tested your drug on children. Uh, that, of course, is usually difficult because parents are not wild about having their drugs tested on their child. Uh, but... Um, so, uh, and then the, 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 then the generic companies who would like to come in with their generic drug, uh, th they would like to ride on the back of the primary drug producer. And the way that they're kept out is that they don't get access to all of the data that was used in order to authorize the marketing of the drug. And, and then eventually, uh, after this period of market authorization uh, period, then uh, uh, the generics are allowed to come in and they're use, allowed to use that authorization. They simply say, I'm producing a drug which is similar, uh, and then they can go on the market eventually. But of course, uh, th th this, this is where litigation gets big. Um, so uh, as you can see, uh, it, once you have a, a patent, then of course you can prevent your competitors. That's the monopoly. And then the other aspect is that uh, you know, if you were the tech trans office here in, in DTU, what you're looking to do is to license it. And then if you're lucky and you're the inventor, maybe you'll get a royalty out of it after all other expenses are paid. Um, the other aspect about um, patenting is that the, even if the patent isn't granted, it will be published within one and a half years of filing. 
And, of course, the publication uh, will then be out there and will limit the possibility of the next person to uh, gain patent rights. So um, what about the uh, uh, advantages of patent protection over, for example, copyright? Uh, the protection is broad. Uh, normally, um, you would get a, a patent claims granted to the product, the use of the product, the method of making the product. So you get a whole range of different kinds of claims. Um, while with a copyright, you only have the, the one single item. And the same applies to design, design patent rights. It's only to the, the, the design, the product itself. You can't have a method claim or anything like that. Um, but in order to get this uh, granted patent, there are things that you have to do. You have to describe uh, the, uh, you have to make a description of the invention. You have to, of course, go through a registration process and you have to get the patent examined and approved. Uh, and then you're, en you, you're limited to this 20 years. And you're not only limited to the time, but also you're limited to the country uh, because you have to apply for patent rights. And the more countries you want protection, the more it's going to cost you. Uh, the copyright protection, as I say, is narrower, uh, but of course is for a longer time. Um, OK. Uh. So um, what do we need in order to get an invention? Uh, this, uh, this slide here, it, it may sound, it's, it, it's often difficult to describe what we mean by an invention. But you could say that uh, what you seek with a patent is this monopoly, this exclusion, exclusion rights. And you say, OK, it's a bit like saying, uh, I have bought a stake of land. And round the edge of my block of land, I have placed a fence. And so that everything within the fence, that block of area, that is mine. And nobody else can come in and play in my area of land. That's mine. It's trespassing to come in. Um, and of course, now th th that is effectively what a patent gives you. It gives you this area of territory where you have exclusive rights. And then you're going to say to me, well, how do we go from patent claim to this sort of exclusive area? The exclusive area is made up of, uh, let's say, um, we'll say that it's, uh, the area is something to do with, we'll say it's a pencil. So we're talking about a pencil. Um, and then the area is, this area is made up of, uh, I have patent rights to a pencil, and the pencil has to have a rubber at one end, a lead at the other end, and a clip to hold on my sweater. That is the rights I have been granted, or this is what I'm going to go for. So then, then, then anybody else wishing to go out and sell a pencil like mine will then end up infringing my patent rights if the patent to the pencil is granted. And when I say, well, uh, you know, I have defined what this pencil is about. It has the rubber, it has the clip, and it has the lead. So those are the three things. And of course, a pencil is, you know, it, it, we know it has a rod, a sort of shaft. Uh, then, of course, um, implicitly in this, when I say a rubber, I mean a rubber of any color, a rubber of any shape. All it has to do is to be able to fit in. So then <coughs> those are, that is, as it were, the territory that you are going to get rights to. So then the question is, is, is this novel? So uh, in order to get patent rights, there must not be any item that lies within my territory. Uh, so what would be an item which lives, lies within a territory of a pencil? That would be someone else who's already selling a pencil with a hook and a rubber and a lead. Um, if the pencil did not have the hook on the edge, the, the other party, then they would be missing an item. So my pencil would be new in comparison to the known pencil because now I have a clip to hang on my sweater. <coughs> That's how novelty works. So basically we, are, we want to have a situation where what is known is an item whose features lie outside my territory because 
This item, in the case of the pencil, lacks the hook. So this is what we're talking about. So it says it, it has to be new. The exact same invention must not yet have been publicly disclosed in any way. Fine. And that publicly disclosed means that you made a pencil in your garage, and you took it to work, and your friend saw it, and you showed it around, then it will be known. Uh, it was published on the web, uh, it was in an article, it was in a patent application, in a book, newspaper, any kind of public. And of course, when you make the stuff in the garage and take it and show it to the students, people won't know about that, not generally, so, so you might get away with that. Okay, in addition, in order for a patent to be uh, uh, granted, the invention must not be obvious. The invention must differ from what is known, similar inventions, fr f known from similar inventions in a non-trivial manner. Okay, so how would we assess this? Okay, we are in a situation where we say, okay, we have the pencil with the clip uh, to clip on my sweater. The only difference from the pra was the clip. Uh, then the question is, would it have been obvious to take a pencil, known in the pra art, and add a clip? Uh, in order to hang it from my sweater. And then you, you might then go to other technologies or other items uh, where, um, for example, you have uh, f uh, some uh, gadget that, uh, that you might use a tool which you want to be able to clip, clip <coughs> on your trousers. For example, this uh, microphone here that has a metal clip and it's able to clip on my clothes. So the, the task is how to clip uh, the problem would be how to clip something to my clothes. And then uh, someone could say, well, it would be obvious to use the clip here and apply it to the pencil so that I can clip it on my clothes or my rucksack or whatever. So that's the kind of thinking that you would do. Would it be obvious to do that? And, and, and of course, it would require two documents because if the first source of information described everything, then the invention would not be novel. If it's missing an item, then it is novel. Then the question, would it be obvious to have added this additional feature? And the addition of the additional feature comes from a second document. Um, so here we are. We have the, uh, the, 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 we had the, the pencil of the pra art, and now my pencil with a clip. And the question is, would it, be ob would it have been obvious to add a clip? Uh, and this is the type of discussions you would have with patent authorities, convincing them that you know, this would have been, yeah? Um, I have a question for the first one, like the invention has to be new and not publicly yeah. disclosed. Yeah. If we make a website and um, explain our invention on that website, then would it have been publicly disclosed? Like, would it be possible to get a patent? Um, if you have disclosed uh, and described uh, how, if, if someone else could read it and carry it out, then the answer is you can't patent it anymore. Uh, if, however, you describe something on the web, but there are details where you haven't really told, I and mean, you said, look, you know, we've, you know, I, I, I could, for example, go on the web and say, well, uh, here is a, I have a fantastic pencil. And uh, this pencil is fantastic because it automatically extends the lead, so it's always at the right length when I use it. But I don't tell the public how in the hell that works. That would be patentable, because I haven't told people the, the solution of, I've told them what the nice to have would be, but I haven't told them the solution. So. Uh. Okay, in addition to getting a patent, uh, you need to uh, describe the invention in sufficient detail. And this is to do with the fact that uh, it's a quid pro quo between the inventor and society. Society is giving the inventor these exclusive rights for 20 years. That's the public agreeing with the inventor. This is, this is really a, 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 an important aspect of society. Society, it's through their governments and or public authorities, are granting an inventor something. It's, it's a sort of a mix between society and, and commercial interests. So that, uh, um, that uh, 
agreement between the public and the inventor has certain you know, moral kind of obligations. And, 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 uh, and, and that is that you, you have to describe how to carry out the invention. And, and you, you may wonder why that should be so important. Um, this is, the invention, inventions among other things, and this, this agreement about publishing it, is something to do with promoting uh, progress in, in the technological field. So does anybody have an idea about why should it be important that the inventor is obliged to inform the public precisely how to carry out the patent invention? In the office. Uh, yeah? I guess when the patent has run out, then it's possible for everyone to, to do the same thing, because they just do what it says in the patent. Uh, the moment it's published. Yes, um, but but it's a bit. Uh, it's not just that because of course, if if you read if you read the moment the public the, the application is published one and a half years, it's not yet granted, but it is out there and it's published long before it's going to be granted. Um, of course, it would be possible for others to build upon that patent. Precisely, precisely. That is exactly what it's all about. And of course, you could have a situation where, uh, I mean, one unfortunate aspect is that um, if you progress from the pencil, so we now have published our application with the pencil, with the lead and the hook and the lead, uh, and then we're going to go one step further. Um, uh, so I'm going to, to develop this further. So as I said, uh, I'm going to have a situation where the lead is always at the right length. So I have some automatic mechanism inside the pen. So what would be, so I could go out and file a patent application, which is to a pencil with a hook and a lead and an automatically extending lead. Does, what, if I wanted to go out and sell that, would I be able to do so if the patent application to the pencil were granted? Any answers? You would have to license it? Right, because the first person has dominant rights, because he has he has the right to any pencil. It doesn't have to have what you would write in a patent claim is a pencil comprising. So if someone else adds an extra sort of bit to the pencil, it's still a pencil with all these things, and it could. So any later person who tries to sell a pencil with these things, uh, with any possible other addition, he would then infringe the rights to the pencil. So I would have the dominant rights, and the next person would have the um, he, he would have a he would have a patentable invention, and then uh, but it would be an improvement. Now, what would be the cheapest solution for the sub sub? I mean, the person with the second patent. What would he do? Uh, do you think? I mean, he would have to buy a license from the patent holder. But what else do you think? What possibilities might he also have? Yeah. He can slightly change. Uh, depending on the claims, uh, so that he maybe don't have a clip and he, he didn't have uh, some of the things so that he will change the written. Yeah, he, that's certainly a possibility. You could do that. Yes. Um, and, uh, but let's imagine that the, 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 the lead extension is super popular. Uh, what might he otherwise do? Let's say he doesn't really have money to pay for this license from the license holder. What, what could he then do? He's a bit short of cash. Uh, he goes to the dominant person and he, he says, look, you know, I really, I want to sell my pencil. Uh, I don't have time, money to pay the license fee, really, but I, I, I want to do things legally. I'm going to come to you. What can we do? What would he? Oh, I was just thinking maybe you could think of some other way of doing it that right. has been repeated mm -hmm. before. But another thing could be like partnering up with the, the guy with the... Yes, or cross-licensing. Yeah. Because if the, you could cross-license because the next person, if he's really made a, a, a progress and everybody wants the pencil with the lead extension, extender, then of course you know, nobody wants the original pencil, they only want the one with the extender, in which case maybe the dominant right holder would like to have a share of that market. So that would be a sort of solution to that problem. Um, and then of course uh, here, 
it says the patent claims need to give a clear definition of the scope of the protected invention. That, of course, is important. Again, that relates to the, the, the deal between the inventor and society. That, uh, the, that if, if I have a patent claim and I have patent rights and you in the public go out and sell my patented product, what am I going to do? Any offers? Um, okay, uh, you know, if, if you've heard of the word infringement, so if I have patent rights and you, you sell something I've patented, then I will sue you. I'll take you to court for infringement. Uh, so, so that's uh, uh, a very serious business. So let's imagine one of you come along to uh, a small um, venture capital fund and you say, look, I've got the pencil. Uh, I want to start manufacturing it. I've, I've applied for a patent application. Uh, I think it's really a very promising a product. Uh, what is he going to say to you? What, what is one of the first things he's going to say about uh, selling this uh, or going ahead and putting money in? Have you any thoughts about what criteria he might think in terms of IP? Protected? Hmm? Is it protected? Uh, yeah, I mean, it could be, I mean, it's a question of whether have you protected it or has someone else done so? And are you at risk of infringing other people's rights? No one will put money into a, in a business uh, venture if actually they're likely to end up infringing someone's patents. So that's, uh, you know, a very... So, so the, the question then is, okay, uh, you, you go to the venture capitalist and you say, look, I want to start my company. Uh, I have this idea about the pencil. And he says, uh, well, are you sure that you're not going to infringe someone else's rights? And then you say, oh, no, uh, I've looked at five patents which have been granted, and you know, I've looked at them very carefully, and I will not infringe. I'm sure about that. Uh, and uh, so you should go ahead and give me the money. But the problem is, is uh, do you infringe or don't you? Do you really know what the scope? Do, do you really know what the boundary is? Are you inside or you're outside? Is, is, is the extending lead the same as yours that they had that was described in the patent application, or was it not? Uh, is the clip the same, or is it not the same clip? That can be very difficult to decide. So, so um, of course, the, the authorities, the public authorities, they wish to be fair to the public. So you are the public. You are out there doing your business, uh, developing new products. You need to be given a fair chance of knowing that when you invest in something, you know whether you're going to infringe or not. You, you, you must, there must be sh you know, sharp borders. So in other words, of course, the sharp borders are, as I've tried to explain, something to do with you know, saying it has a, 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 a clip and it has a rubber. And, and people should know, yes, this is a rubber or it's not a rubber. So th you, you have to define these things very clearly so that the third party knows that he is always not going to infringe. So that's uh, really what is uh, important. OK, if I will just go to 10 o'clock and then take a break. Is that right? Yeah? Um, OK, now I will just come into, now we've talked a little bit about uh, what does it take to get a patent. Now we'll talk a bit about what is patentable. Um, so. Here you have a uh, mathematical algorithm. And, um, you know, it could well be novel. And it could well be very inventive. Yeah? And it could be useful. You could probably describe it. Um, uh, and you could write a patent claim, which is very clear. You could say, you know, I claim an algorithm with these features. So, you know, the question is then, is, is it patentable or is it not? Well, uh, how about this? This is a patent claim. And we'll look at what, what, is it, um, what does this patent claim involve? It's a method. Sorry. Uh, it's a method. And um, as I say, you can patent products, methods, uses in Europe. Okay, so we have a method, and it's to do with controlling a combustion process. So it's, let's say, a furnace of some sort. Okay? 
and the method steps uh, that make up this invention are that first you measure light emitted by the combustion process. This would be the furnace, the light generated by burning. Um, so you measure that light and you get some data for the amount of light. Then you uh, use this uh, uh, algorithm to convert the light intensity uh, or to calculate the light intensity as a function of time. And the information you get out of that, the amount of light per time, you then use for controlling the combustion process. <clears throat> so so you, effectively, you are measuring something. Uh, you're measuring light quantity. You're actively carrying out this measurement of, of, with an instrument. And finally, having used all this information, you're going to regulate the speed of you're actively going to control the speed of the combustion. So that's another kind of claim. No, no, we'll, we'll, we'll now go forwards and see, well, you know, is this sort of thing patentable or not? OK, well, <clears throat> uh, the situation is that a mathematical algorithm per se is not uh, an invention. It's simply a, you could say, it's a discovery. And it has no, uh, it, 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 it's uh, interesting, it has possibilities, but you haven't done anything with it. It has no technical, uh, you have not, uh, inventions are to do with technical processes, and it has no technical features. You're not uh, solving a technical problem in a technical manner. So this is because when you are blackboard, you are putting abstract numbers onto the, into the, the equation and you are deriving abstract numbers out. The input and the output are simply numbers. There's no uh, technical step which is taken as a result of obtaining this information. Uh, while on the other hand, uh, when you go in and measure data and use it to control a machinery, then you are, th there is a you are using the information for a regulating a technical process, so you uh, control the speed of a machine. So these are the reasons why an algorithm would not be patentable. Uh, how about this? Here we have a, um, uh, a, a method uh, of determining optimal trading time for a financial instrument. So uh, here we are, we're in the stock exchange. Uh, we're monitoring the price of financial instruments as a function of time. We're using the information, uh, uh, we're using a Fourier transform to monitor the price, and then we're determining when to sell. So, uh, does anybody have any thoughts about whether this has any technical? Another Sorry? I have another question. Okay, fine. Um, I just had on the Fourier transform, I mean, the name is associated with the transform. Yeah. So that's a, a mathematical uh, oh, equation. Yeah. So how much protection, you know, it's not a patent, but say if I start calling it the Brownian transform, how much protection is it for Fourier to his name on that transform? Or any, any sort of uh, equation that's created or method? To put his name on it? Yeah, I mean, it's a Fourier transform. And people, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, a piece of math, right? Yes. It's not a patent. No. But still, there is some form of protection there, right? No. His name. What's, what's well, stopping people from naming it some other type of transform? Well, then... I'm not the same, but I was wondering... Okay. Um, I mean, a name could be protected by copyright or trademark, uh, not by patent protection. And uh, the, the algorithm, per se, does not change as a result of giving it a different name. So it's a bit like a pencil is a pencil. I mean, I could call it a brown pencil, but it's still a pencil. So, so in the patent world, everything is very much, you know, what do you technically do you have in your hands? You can give it a name, but it's a question of what is its physical structure and what can it do? OK, so, so here, um, basically, we, we are Again, we're in the situation where we have numbers in and numbers out. We haven't done anything with this. Uh, we haven't, all we've done is, at the end of the day, we have determined optimal trading time. 
uh, how about this? Here we have a method of selling candy by presenting the candy in a way that catches kids' attention. Um, does anybody have any ideas about uh, what the technical aspect of this is? Is there any technical aspect? No? The show? Hmm? The show? The boxes? Uh, the way they are arranged? Uh, yes. And, and then uh, what is this... Uh, what is the information used for? It's, it's visual information, which is then uh, used to attract people's attention. So there's no technical output. Um, I can give you a, a, a different example. And here we have, a, similar, we have a shelving unit in a supermarket. And uh, the shelving unit consists of a shelf. It has a motion sensor for detecting motion in a predetermined proximity to the shelf. So you come near to the shelf, and the motion sensor will detect you. It then has an audio system for generating audio output. That may, might be, you know, the shop is then telling you, here is a recipe, uh, Klaus Meyer recipe. So the shop, the shelf then comes out with this message saying, you know, on this shelf you will find these vegetables and you could make the following recipe. Uh, and then a control unit for activating the audio system responsive to the detection signal. So here you have a, a technical, uh, you, you, you have a, a sensor, but what you're doing is that you are, um, uh, you are regulating the, the audio system to come off, on and go off. So here you have a technical part of your invention. That's the, the, the difference. So in order to have a, a computer implemented uh, invention, there must be a technical solution to a technical problem. And the technical problem must not be obvious. And that's the difference between the, the here where there's you, you see the colored pattern, but nothing, uh, you're not solving a technical problem. The, the, the problem was to, uh, you know, get the child to see, the, um, to see the, the, the sweeties, while in the supermarket, the, the, the technical problem was to switch on and off an audio system. So that's a technical result. So it's, in other words, the, the, this one is how to have an audio system turn on when a shopper comes close to the shelf. That, that, that's the, the difference. Here there's, uh, there's no, it's a pretty pattern, but it, it doesn't regulate anything technical. Uh, and here we, here we again have the uh, trading example that I gave you before, which is not patentable, but uh, we could uh, redefine it as a computer. So we could then say, okay, we have a computer for determining optimal trading time, um, it has a communications in interface for receiving price information. It processes this information, and it has a trading inf interface connected to the stock market for when to sell. That, that would be considered a computer adapted to carry out and, and carry out and instruct uh, buying and selling. That, that would be a would have a technical feature. Um, <clears throat> But the only problem here is that the patent authorities, when they read this patent claim, they will reread it like this. They will, uh, they will substitute many of the parts of your claim. Uh, and anything they think is non-technical, they will replace with uh, something like an action or an input data or action time. And it could well be that uh, the technical input here is too small to be patentable. So, um, I mean, I, I, I have a feeling that in, in, as I say, in your area of, 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 of work that you may, you, your inventions might may come close to this sort of area. So it's, it's not trivial that you should be aware of, of how patent authorities are only going to look at your invention in terms of its technical features and not uh, anything to do with algorithms or simply business information. So business information coming in and out is not patentable in Europe. There has to be some technical uh, controlling or, or, or mechanism going on. 
uh, and uh, the, the, the rules in different parts of the world are, are, are largely similar. In other words, that uh, what is patentable in all over the world is, is pretty much that it, it has to be a technical uh, solution to a technical problem and there must be technical aspects. Uh, and, and in the States, uh, there, there's, there's, they're slightly, they're discussing now whether business methods can be patented in the States that will, um, is a subject for you know, discussion. Okay, um, before I go on to the student projects, then I thought that we should take a five, ten minute break. And uh, then uh, my thoughts were that there were three projects that I picked out and um, I thought that each group could come up here and then we could uh, interact, uh, you could interact with the group and we could discuss uh, a little bit about um, how one would assess the patentability and, uh, of, of, of each of these uh, inventions. Is that okay? Should we say back at 10 past? Yeah. Okay, great.